Well, this morning we return again to the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. You can turn there with me. And we find ourselves uh, this morning in the middle of what has been properly called a thank you note written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi in response to a financial gift that they had sent him. And Epaphroditus, their servant and messenger, has made the 40 days journey from eastern Greece to central Italy in order to deliver the Philippians' gift to Paul, which they hoped would minister to Paul uh, during his imprisonment in Rome. And he's received that gift from Epaphroditus and has been blessed by it. And so as he prepares to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi with this letter of the, what we call the, Philipp- the letter to the Philippians, with that letter in his hand, and after addressing a number of his own pastoral concerns to, his, to this dear church in the body of the letter, he now takes up this subject of communicating his gratitude to the Philippians for their gracious, gracious and generous support of him in the midst of his present affliction. And so, in verses 10 to 20 of chapter 4, we have Paul's thank you note to the Philippians for their gift. And we noted last time that Paul has a great concern to attend to as he writes this thank you note. And that concern is that he would tactfully and courteously express his gratitude and appreciation to the Philippians for their gift, while at the same time not giving the impression that his heart was set on receiving their gift. He wants to honor the Philippians for their well-doing But he also doesn't want to dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ by speaking in such a way that will lead the Philippians to believe that Christ was not sufficient to sustain Paul's joy and contentment in his difficult circumstances. So he's walking this tightrope of expressing sincere thanks to the people of God on the one hand for their partnership with him in the gospel, and then on the other hand doing that without sinful flattery without conveying a sense of faithless desperation that would dishonor the glory and sufficiency of Christ. And so you see him trying to maintain this balance all throughout the thank you note. In verse 10, he starts by telling the Philippians that he rejoiced greatly to receive their gift. But then he immediately qualifies that statement because he doesn't want people to think that that great rejoicing is directly tied to money. He says in verse 11, not that I speak from want, for I have learned in whatever cir- to be content in whatever circumstances I am. And then he goes on in verses 12 and 13, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. I've learned the secret of being hungry and being filled. I can do all things. I can- am content in all circumstances because of the union that I have with Christ who strengthens me. So he says, yes, I, I rejoice greatly in, giving, in receiving your gift, but that's not because I'm not satisfied in Christ. If, if I have him, I have everything I need. So he's, he's sort of walking that balance. And then again, in verse 14, he, he immediately repositions on that tightrope, tightrope again. He's trying to, to stay balanced. After going on about how his true sufficiency and contentment are in Christ and not in things, Well, he's aware that the Philippians may have gotten the wrong impression from that kind of a qualification. They might have thought, well, if Paul was so content without our gift, well, maybe he didn't need it. Or worse, maybe he didn't appreciate it. And so Paul says, yes, dear friends, make no mistake that I am content in Christ no matter my circumstances. Nevertheless, verse 14, let me say explicitly, you have done well in giving me this sacrificial gift. In fact, verses 15 and 16, I recognize, my dear Philippians, that this most recent financial gift of yours was only the latest instance in a long history of your earnest and sacrificial giving. Over 10 years ago, when you were first converted to Christ, you were the only church to partner with me financially. And you supported me more than once immediately after I left. So please don't misunderstand, dear friends. I do appreciate your gift. It touches my very heart. And then it's as if he recognizes that even that kind of gratefulness can sound a little bit over the top. 
And so he shifts his balance on that tightrope once again in verse 17. He doesn't want the Philippians or anyone else to think that he's being so complimentary because he's trying to coax some more money out of them. So he says in verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself. The reason I'm rejoicing and the reason I'm commending you for your giving is because I know that spiritual blessing attends earnest sacrificial giving, and I'm after the profit that increases to your spiritual account. And it's really lovely to observe the way that Paul walks this fine line of tactful courtesy and theological accuracy. His pastoral sensitivity and, and graciousness is instructive to all of us as to how we're to interact with one another. Some of you in, the, in this room are not very concerned with whether particular words and phrases that you might use might unintentionally communicate things that are not true about God or the gospel or Christ or the Word. But Paul was careful that the expression of his sincere thanks wouldn't give the impression that Christ was less satisfying than he is. His example then provides a rebuke for that kind of laziness and urges you to bring the truth of the gospel and of Christ and of all the truths of Scripture to bear on even the most mundane facets of your life, even in the way that you speak about things, even in the way that you might say thank you. And others of you in the room are fastidious about dotting every theological I and crossing every doctrinal T. But your problem is that you can tend to be harsh and brash and ungracious as you wield your theology. But Paul goes out of his way and chooses his words and his tone very carefully in order not to cause unnecessary offense to the Philippians. And so his example there provides a rebuke for you for that lack of graciousness and exhorts you to put on the tenderness and meekness of Christ as you conduct yourselves with your brothers and sisters. And it's precisely because the implications of the gospel have touched every area of Paul's life, because he's so driven and so dominated by Christ and his gospel, even the way that he writes his thank you notes proves instructive and interesting for us. Two sermons ago, as we studied verses 10 to 13, we found that beneath the surface of this thank you note, Paul provided us with a theology of Christian contentment. We saw that true, this is just recap here, we saw that true Christian contentment patiently trusts in the sovereign providence of God, verse 10. We saw that it's independent of the circumstances of life in verses 11 and 12. We saw that it's satisfied in the surpassing value of Christ, verses 12 and 13, and that it's fueled by the strength of our Savior in verse 13. And then last week, we found that beneath the second portion of Paul's thank you note, he'd begun, he'd begun giving us a theology of Christian giving. So Christian contentment and then Christian giving. And we saw in that sermon that true Christ-honoring giving both leads to and is rooted in true biblical fellowship. It leads to and is rooted in true biblical genuine fellowship. And we saw thirdly that giving is driven by the gospel, that the gospel is what melts stingy hearts and self-centered hearts to be gracious and liberal in their giving. And then we also saw fourthly that giving is attained by pursuing God's promised blessings, that we go after increasing measures of grace in our giving, increasing maturity in our giving by believing the promises of God that attend such giving. When God promises reward for obedience, it behooves us to set those rewards before us and pursue them diligently. Well, as we come then this morning to the final three verses in Paul's thank you note, we discover that he wasn't done with his theology of Christian giving in verse 17. There are more principles to guide and direct us in our giving to the work of God. And, and Paul would seek that we would understand not only those four that we talked about last time, but also three other ones for this morning. So let me read our passage, Philippians chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. 
Paul says, but I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So as I mentioned in these verses, we have a bit of a part two to Paul's theology of gospel-driven giving that he began in verse 14. In verses 18 to 20, we can glean another three principles that provide wonderful instruction for us concerning the matter of true, Christ-honoring, gospel-driven giving. Three principles for true, Christ-honoring, gospel-driven giving. Now, that'll be our outline this morning. Well, the, the first principle that we see in this passage is that giving is to be generous and sacrificial. Giving is to be generous and sacrificial. And I take that from the first half of verse 18. Paul says, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. And before we jump right into the illustration of that principle, you see here again that Paul continues to walk this fine line of courtesy intact. He's just qualified his commendation of them for their giving, assuring them that he's not after prying more money out of their hands. But again, lest they doubt Paul's appreciation for the gift, he adds this comment to assure them that their generosity has truly met real needs in his own life. And he insists upon that by using three increasingly emphatic verbs, one right after the other. Two sort of grouped together, and then a third one. He says, I have received everything in full and have an abundance. An abundance there is the same word that Paul used in verse 12 to explain that he's learned the secret, both of having abundance and suffering need. And so, whatever need he was suffering in the context of his Roman imprisonment, it had been met by the Philippians' gift, such that now he has an abundance. Those things are contrasted. And so he was in need, now he has an abundance. The Greek word means to overflow. It means to have an excess or to have more than enough. And then he adds the phrase, I am amply supplied, it's, which is the Greek word pepleiraomai, or from, from pleirao, which is the word for to fill up. Paul says, thanks to your gift, I am full to overflowing. Paul was delightfully overwhelmed by the Philippians' generosity. And here I have to remind you that everything we know about the general economic condition of the Philippian church indicates that this couldn't have been an objectively large sum of money. Remember that in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 2, Paul wrote that the churches of Macedonia gave to the needs of the saints while they were in a great ordeal of affliction and in deep poverty, the text says. In a great ordeal of affliction and in deep poverty. And so from any objective standpoint, their offering couldn't have been that much. And yet Paul, in prison, with no savings account, with no IRA, with little clothing on his back and even less food in his stomach can say, I have more than enough. I am full to overflowing. Spurgeon comments, see how little a gift may make a good man glad. See how little a gift may make a good man glad. Some would grumble over a roasted ox, but here is Paul rejoicing over a dinner of herbs. And that is a lesson to us, friends, reminding us of our teaching on contentment from a few weeks ago. Some of you sitting here this morning could receive a hundred times what Paul received from the Philippians and would still be prone to anxiety, to complaining, and to covetousness. But we need to learn something of the spirit of the Apostle Paul, who 
because he had caught a glimpse of what verse 19 calls God's riches in glory put on display in Christ Jesus. And because of the surpassing value of that glory that satisfied the very depths of his soul, he could receive this relatively meager gift and count himself a rich man. Friends, I ask you, could you do the same? Could you do the same? And if you say in your heart, yeah, I think I could do the same. Does your present way of life reflect that now? Does your, your present way of life reflect that truth that you could be satisfied with little? Does it reflect that now? And if not, how can you bring it more in line with that truth? A question to ponder for later today. But then to the point of application that I mentioned at the beginning here, giving is to be generous and sacrificial. Paul says, as a result of the Philippians' gift, I have all things in abound. I'm filled to overflowing. Now, as I said, from an objective measure, the Philippians' gift couldn't have been all that much. But relative to their general condition of poverty, this gift was likely a great sacrifice for them. And that is an example to us. Turn with me this time to 2 Corinthians 8. We'll read that text together. I just want to see that you can see it with your own eyes. It's a magnificent text in which Paul speaks of the generosity of the churches of Macedonia, of which the Philippians were a significant representative. <coughs> and in 2 Corinthians 8, starting in verse 1, he says, now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Verse 2, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. What an absolutely magnificent picture of the kind of self-sacrifice and inconvenient generosity that the gospel produces in the hearts of God's people. In a great ordeal of affliction, in deep poverty, these dear saints begged the apostles they didn't have to have their arms twisted with fundraising campaigns. They begged that they might be allowed to give beyond their ability. This is what the gospel produces in people, friends. This is the gospel at work. That's why Paul says he wishes to make known to the Corinthians the grace of God which had been given in the churches of Macedonia because only the grace of God experienced in the gospel of Christ, the gospel that opens blind eyes to see the loveliness and the surpassing value of the glory of God revealed in the face of Christ. Only the grace of God could loosen the vice grip of the naturally selfish human heart from clinging to its own material comforts. Only the gospel can free people to beg, to beg without being manipulated, without being coerced, for the favor of the participation in the support of the saints, in support of God's people. You see, true Christ-honoring, gospel-driven giving is to be generous and sacrificial because it's that kind of giving that puts the all-satisfying richness of the glory of God on full display. Giving is to be generous and sacrificial because it's that kind of giving that puts the all-satisfying richness of the glory of God on display. Because you, you recognize that if I have that, I have all that I need. And so you become free to give generously, sacrificially, because Christ is worth more to you than anything that you could possibly cling to of your own material resources. And King David understood this. I want you to turn with me to the very last section of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 24, just before the beginning of the book of 1 Kings. 2 
2 Samuel 24, just to remind you the context there, David was faithless and prideful in commanding that a census of Israel be taken. And because of that, God sends a pestilence upon the nation, and 70,000 people in Israel die. And so David goes to God and pleads for mercy and says, this is my sin. Why should you destroy the nation? Visit my house in punishment. And, and God directs him as a result of that prayer, really, of repentance. He says, build an altar on the threshing floor of a man named Arauna.'" Okay, so go to this guy's house, go to his threshing, threshing floor, build an altar, and sacrifice to me there. So David goes to this man and offers to buy his threshing floor from him. And he says, the Arauna, the man says, hey, listen, you're the king. You can have my threshing floor. Take, take the threshing floor. Take the oxen for the burnt offering. Take whatever you need. Whatever you have, you can have it. Whatever you need, you can have it. And you remember what David says? Verse 24, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Why? For I will not offer burnt offerings to Yahweh my God, which cost me nothing. I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. You say, Pastor Mike, how much money should I give to the church? 10%? Tithing? Well, tithing was an Old Testament principle that was binding upon the nation of Israel. And the New Testament doesn't give us a fixed number. But the principle that I can give you is that it should cost you something. That true Christian giving is to be generous and sacrificial. If David, under the limited light of the shadows of the Old Covenant, could resolve that he wouldn't give to God that which cost him nothing. How can we, with the full radiance of the gospel light shining in the face of Christ, how can we give to God that which costs us nothing? If anything, the standard for giving goes up in the new covenant era from the old covenant era. With greater light, greater revelation, greater glory should come greater commitment, greater gladness, greater sacrifice and joyous generosity. And so I ask, where is that Macedonian spirit among us that begs for the favor of, of the part, begs for the favor of participating in giving to the needs of God's people, that gives even out of deep poverty, let alone comfortable upper middle class standards? May God cause His grace to visit Grace Church and to visit Grace Life in the way that it has visited those dear saints at Philippi so that our giving would continue to be generous and sacrificial, even amid meager resources. Well, secondly, not only is giving to be generous and sacrificial, but a second principle for true Christian giving is that giving is an act of spiritual worship. Giving is an act of spiritual worship. Look with me again at verse 18. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And here Paul moves from the language of commerce and accounting to three parallel phrases that describe Christian giving in the language of Old Testament sacrificial worship. And that language originated all the way back in Genesis chapter 8 as Noah worshipped God with his family as they emerged unharmed from the ark. And through the worldwide flood of God's judgment, they came out of the ark. And in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And verse 21, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. That's our phrase, the fragrant aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground. 
on account of man. See, that was the essence of worship under the old covenant. God's people were commanded to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and mind and strength. They were commanded to worship and serve Him only. They were commanded to have no other gods before Him. And a principal way in which His people demonstrated that God had occupied the first place in their hearts was by offering up to Him the first fruits of their livestock, by, by dedicating animals to God that they would have otherwise been, have used for food or for uh, labor, securing profit through agricultural labor. So as an act of worship, as a lived-out demonstration that they regarded God as more worthy than their own possessions, like David, they gave God which, that which cost them something. And because that was the heart attitude of a faithful worshiper who brought a sacrifice to God, the one who recognized God's worth above all and thus could part gladly and even eagerly with a portion of what God had given to him, when the odor of the burnt flesh of an ox or a bull or a ram ascended into the heavens, rather than the disgusting stench of burnt flesh, the text says that it reached the nostrils of God and was to Him a soothing aroma, a fragrant aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And Paul uses this very same imagery and applies it to the giving of God's people in the service of the gospel. He says, Oh, Philippians, when Epaphroditus arrived in Rome and laid before me the gift that you had sent with him, it was as if my physical needs were an altar and your gifts were the sacrifice laid upon that altar. And because your gift was rooted in true fellowship, because it was driven by the gospel, because it was generous and sacrificial and came from a glad and willing heart, when Epaphroditus set those coins before me to meet my needs, a soothing aroma wafted into heaven and God smelled the sweet-smelling aroma of a spiritual sacrifice, and He was pleased. He smiled, well-pleasing to God. And friends, this is the way the New Testament speaks of the present ministry of you, the people of God in this age. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6 says, we are a kingdom of priests to God. A kingdom of priests and the sacrifices that we're to bring before God are not the carcasses of bulls and goats. But as Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. There's another one of our phrases in Philippians 4, which is your spiritual latreia, your spiritual service of worship, the language of temple worship of sacrifice. 1 Peter 2.5 says that the people of God are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. We're priests offering spiritual sacrifices. And then in Hebrews 13 verses 15 and 16, we find that the author mentions those spiritual sacrifices even more specifically. What specifically are at least some of these spiritual sacrifices? Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through Christ, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that gives thanks to His name. So that's one thing, praising God with our lips, singing worship, speaking worship to Him. And then he says in verse 16, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. You see, the sharing of the needs of the saints are sacrifices, well-pleasing to God. And what that teaches us is that true Christian giving is an act of a sacred act of spiritual worship. Whatever benefit that our gifts bring to fellow believers, the ultimate recipient of all of our giving is none other than God Himself. 
You see, Paul understood the principle that the Lord Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 25, where in the last day, the king will look to those on his right and tell them to come and inherit the everlasting kingdom because, he says, he was hungry and they fed him and he was thirsty and they gave him to drink and he was naked and they clothed him and he was in prison and they came to visit him. And then he says, the righteous will at that point, they will turn to him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison? We've never seen that. And Jesus responds, Matthew 25, verse 40, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of my brothers, one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. You did it to me. See, Paul understands that principle. How could he not, right? He was the one who was confronted by the risen Christ on the Damascus Road as he sought to continue in his murderous persecution of the church of God. The Lord came to him, struck him to the ground, and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting not my people, which was the case, but Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, because of the vital spiritual union that exists between Christ and His people, because by the grace of God, we are bound up and immersed, as it were, into the person of Christ. What we do to even the least of our brethren, whether for good or for ill, we do to Christ. And that means that our giving is an act of spiritual worship to God. Our giving is catapulted out of the realm of the merely horizontal relationships between our fellow man up into the realm of our worship to God himself. That's why when we're gathered across the way in the worship center as the body of Christ, the offering is part of our worship service. It's because we recognize that we're not just participating in some uh, accounting. Wow. Maybe we need better giving to pay the light bill. (laughs) Maybe not. (laughs) There we go. So what was I saying? I was saying that's the reason that when we're across the way where there are lights, um, that the offering is part of our worship service. That's why we pause and pray. It's not so that you can read the Grace Today article and listen to a very fun uh, solo, you know. It's because you need to be preparing your heart to participate in worship. Because again, we're not just taking money from our account to put it in the church's account so they can put it in another believer's account, whether a missionary or a pastor or whoever. We're offering spiritual sacrifices to a holy God. We're priests offering sacrifices to the thrice holy God of heaven. And just as the priests of the Old Testament needed to bring their offering in a right spirit and in purity of heart, so also is our sacrificial worship and giving to be attended with the utmost sobriety and care We're not to be like the priests in the day of the prophet Malachi who despise our duty, the text says, and disdainfully sniff at it. Malachi chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. No, we, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, we must be cheerful givers for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a giver. God loves a a worshiper who from a pure heart delights to offer him the fruit of their labors. The priests of Malachi's day brought defiled food to the altar. They brought not their best and their choicest, but the the lame and the sick. But we're to bring our very best, the first fruits of all of our labors, so that giving to the work of God takes first priority in your checkbook and on your budget sheet. That before any other obligations are met, God is to have his share. That's just simply a reflection of your heart. Who has your heart first? The electric bill? (laughs) 
or God himself. And in the sacrificial worship, you, you remember that the priests were not just to prepare their offering, they were also to prepare themselves, right? You see the regulations for the priests in Leviticus chapters 8 and 9 and elsewhere. It says, the priests were to wash with water. They were to be girded with the priestly robe and the linen ephod. He, the priest was to wear a, a, breast, a breast piece and a turban with a golden plate on the front of it. And the priest was to have uh, his head anointed with oil. And friends, those, the, the, though the preparation itself will look different than that, the principle and the need for that preparation of heart is only increased in the new covenant era. We're, we're going into the holy of holies. We are ushered into the very presence of God through the veil of Christ's flesh, Hebrews 10 says. The priests only did that once a year, and we are there perpetually, continually. And so we are in no less need of the preparation of our own hearts, all the more need. So the preparation of our weekly offerings and sacrificial gifts given to further the work of Christ's kingdom shouldn't be done in a casual, flippant, cavalier manner. You know, writing the check on the, in the car on the way to church. Consider the, the preparation of your giving as an act of worship that it is. Set aside time on, say, Saturday evening to review your finances, to thank God for His provision for your needs, and to ask for His continued provision as you go forward. Pray that He would enable you to give sacrificially and to, to think strategically about how you might be able to bless God's people and contribute to the advance of His kingdom in strategic ways. And then, with your spouse if you're married, or just you before the Lord if you're not, Pray over the gift that you will offer up to God the next morning so that it might be a spiritual sacrifice, a spiritual act of worship. Acknowledge that all that you have comes from Him. Pray that you would offer it in a, with a pure heart, cheerfully and not begrudgingly, but delighted to give the Lord a portion of what He's blessed you with. Pray that God would receive it as an act of worship from a heart made glad by His glorious grace. And though you know that even your best deeds of obedience are laced with enough sin to damn the whole human race, one Puritan said, pray nevertheless that God would receive this offering that you bring to him in the name of Christ, cleansed, as it were, by Christ's own blood so that it would be acceptable to him. We offer spiritual sacrifices, 1 Peter 2.5 says, through Jesus Christ. And then pray that God would bless it as it goes forth from your hand into the hands of those who would steward it for God's kingdom, that he would accomplish his own will by it, that he would multiply its efficacy. And finally, pray that in that act of worship, in that time of preparation, that the Lord Jesus Christ would meet you in fellowship as in a very real sense you partner with him in the advancement of his gospel in the world. Pray that your giving would be an occasion for worship, for communion with the living God, that he would increase the spiritual profit that accrues to your account in the currency of the glory of God shining in the face of Christ. That's the, that's the currency that I want in my account. I want more glory. I want more of Christ. I want, I want more, the clearer sights of him. So pray that he would meet you there in that act of worship. That's what it is. What a privilege that the Lord our God, the holy God, receives our giving. Something that we can count as some, so mundane. He receives that giving as an act of spiritual worship to him. So may we be faithful to such an awesome responsibility the priestly ministry of offering spiritual sacrifices to God. May we not defile his table. May we not defile ourselves by taking those resources which God gives us so that we might set them apart to spiritual service, to pour them out, as it were, on the, on the altar of the needs of the poor, to pour them out on the altar of the needs of the servants of Christ. May it not be that we take those offerings and squander them on worldly luxuries while our brothers and sisters suffer need. 
It should not be so. Well, we've seen then first that giving is to be generous and sacrificial. Second, that giving is an act of spiritual worship to God. And the third principle for true Christ-honoring, gospel-driven giving that we see in this text is, number three, giving results in God's rich provision. Giving results in God's rich provision. Look with me at verse 19. Paul says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So what will be the result of such generous and sacrificial giving that stretches the heart as well as stretching the checking account? What is the result of of giving in full knowledge that our giving is an act of spiritual worship to God? A sacrifice which we know must not cost us nothing? Is it poverty? Is it unmet needs for adequate food and clothing? Pastor, if I give generously, then I give sacrificially as an offering to God of all the fruit of my labors to God. Won't there be unpaid bills if I give proportionate to my income? Won't there be constant uncertainty and anxiety as I don't know where the money is going to come from? Paul says, by no means. By no means. There may be an opportunity for you to be tested in your faith, to trust God and to examine yourselves about whether you are being faithful, sure. But the result of such sacrificial giving, of such Christ-honoring, gospel-driven giving is the rich provision of the God of the universe. Those who give sacrificially will be the special object of the Father's care and compassion. That's what this verse is teaching us. He says, my God will supply all your needs. And the word supply is the the very same Greek word he just used in verse 18 when he said, I am amply supplied. It's the word for to fill up. Paul's saying, "Just, just as my God filled me to overflowing through your gift, so also as you continue to give in sacrificial ways such that you experience true need, so also will my God fulfill. He will satisfy to the full every need of yours according to the riches of of His glory in Christ. And we learned that principle last week as we looked at a number of Scriptures that taught that principle that God will not be outgiven. And you can look back in your notes for those passages. I want to give you more passages this morning. More passages that teach that very same principle. First, Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. God says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. As you honor God first, your barns will be filled and you'll have plenty. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, God challenges the people of Israel to test him in the matter. He says, test me. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And he says, and test me now in this, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Test me. You honor me before all else in your giving and see if I don't pour out blessing from the infinite storehouses of heaven itself until it overflows upon you. Matthew 6.33, familiar verse, but in a context in which the disciples are worried about their necessary food and clothing, the Lord Jesus teaches them, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let your your first and primary concern be the advancement of the kingdom of God, and let that concern be manifested even in the way that you handle your money, and the result will be that these things that you are worried about, your food, your drink, your clothing, all of those things will be added unto you as well. And then... I can't resist to returning to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Turn there with me. Such a a treasure chest 
of instruction on the matter of Christian giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6, it's the familiar passage, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You see, the farmer who spends every dollar that he has on, on seed for his farm realizes that his seed bag is his entire livelihood. What's in that bag is what he has. And yet, if he returns to his farm and, you know, he starts to feel a little attached to that seed and says, well, I mean, I, I can't just start throwing this stuff everywhere. This is my livelihood. This is all that I have. And, and so he pinches a little bit of seed between two fingers and he sows here and he sows there. What's going to happen come harvest time? Not very much at all is going to happen. He's going to have a small harvest. But you see, that's a foolish farmer. That's a farmer who doesn't understand the purpose of seed. You don't have seed so you can collect it. You don't accumulate seed so you can hoard it and store it up. Seed is for sowing. And so the wise farmer returns to his farm with that bag of seed and he sows bountifully. He scatters that seed liberally by the fistfuls and spreads them all over the soil of his property. And when harvest time comes, that farmer will have an abundant, bountiful crop. You see, seed is for sowing. The very reason God has given you financial resources to whatever extent that he's given them to you, he's given them to you for sowing so that you might reap a harvest of righteousness, the text says. And unless you think that that kind of liberal generosity will land you in the poorhouse. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9.10, just a few verses later, verse 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. God says, as you scatter seed bountifully, you're never going to lack seed. But notice, it says you'll never lack seed for sowing. You'll be enriched in everything for what purpose? For all liberality. It's a, it's a glorious cycle of God's grace. As you give faithfully and sacrificially, God will continue to provide for all your needs so that you may continue to give faithfully and sacrificially. And as you seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added unto you. I want to look a bit more closely into this promise of God's rich provision that is the result of gospel-driven giving. First, notice the source of this provision, the source of it. Paul says, my God will supply all your need. See, Paul would have been overjoyed to find himself in a situation one day where he could meet the material needs of the Philippians. But, of course, he's in a Roman prison, himself in need of financial support, which he receives from them. But Paul says, my God will do what I myself am in no position to do. God himself will supply what I could never give according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Spurgeon paraphrased that this way. He said, just as God has through you filled me up, so shall he by Christ fill you up. And so the source of this provision is God himself. Second, notice the certainty of the provision, the source and the certainty of it. Paul does not just say God will supply all your needs. He says, my God will supply all your need. And the use of that personal pronoun emphasizes the intimate communion and personal relationship that Paul had with his God. God was not merely an abstract idea, idea for Paul. This was not just God who Paul had known only in theory. No, this is my God who will fulfill every need of yours. This is the God whom I know, the God whom I've proven over and over again in my life. And, and Paul's saying, I have staked my whole life on him, my whole life on his word, and my God has never let me down. I myself have been in dire need, and yet my God has never failed me. He's always provided. And I tell you, Paul says, that that very same God is your God. And just as he has never failed me, so you can be certain that he will never fail you. No, he will supply 
indicative, certainty. He will supply every need of yours. Thirdly, notice the scope of this provision. And my God will supply some of your needs, most of your needs, your spiritual needs only. No, my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. Now, there can be no mistake that Paul clearly intended that God would supply every spiritual need for the Philippians. His whole letter is about how they're to increase in steadfastness, in humility, in unity, and in joy. But the scope of this provision is not limited to the spiritual realm. He says that God will supply their every need, and he's just used that word need in verse 16 to refer to his own financial need. And so, when he uses the very same word in just three verses later, we shouldn't conclude it means anything less than the material needs of the people of God, who themselves are faithful to give according to God's direction. You say, but Mike, I've, I've given faithfully to the Lord's work, I've done it for decades, and I have material needs. Well, do you have needs or do you have wants? See, what we need and what we think we need are often two different things. Paul doesn't promise that his God will supply every wish of ours. He doesn't promise to supply every luxury of ours. It says he'll supply every need of ours. And if I can put it bluntly, if you don't have it, God thinks you don't need it. There's nothing that the faithful servant of God truly needs that God does not provide. I've been young and now I'm old, the writer says, and I've never seen the righteous begging bread. We move quickly then to the supply of God's provision, the source, the certainty, the scope, and now the supply of God's provision. And this is wonderful. Paul says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. You see, God doesn't simply give out of his riches. God gives according to his riches. That is to say, he gives to his faithful ones in a manner appropriate to or commensurate with his own wealth. And so one commentator captures it well when he writes, these needs he will fulfill not merely out of his riches as a millionaire might do when he donates a trifling sum to a good cause, subtracting the amount from his vast possessions, but according to his riches, so that the gift is actually in proportion to God's infinite resources. You see, when you purpose in your heart to give to the church of God 10, 15, 20% of your wages, you're giving in proportion to your earnings. You're giving according to your resources. Well, Psalm 21.4, friends, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and all of its fullness. God's resources are infinite. So I, I ask you, what's 10% of infinity? You see, now you see something of the image of this limitless bounty of God's provision that Paul intends you to see in this text and to be encouraged by, to be stirred up by. And notice that God's riches are not in the stock market. God's riches are not in real estate. God's riches aren't even in gold. God's riches are in glory. God is rich in glory, and He will supply all your needs in accordance with the infinite supply of His riches in glory. Spurgeon says He'll do it in such a style as becomes His wealth. He'll do it in such a style as becomes His wealth, lavishly, freely. And friends, here is a rock-solid promise of certainty and comfort to those who magnify God's worth by a commitment to sacrificial giving. And you know that He's good for it. You know that He's good for it. Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare His own Son but delivered Him up for us all, how will He also not, well, how will he not also with Him, with Christ, freely give us all things? He's already done the greater. Certainly, he will do the lesser. And again, Spurgeon says, What will he deny us who has given up the best jewel that he had? 
the glorious one that heaven could not match. What lesser jewel will he deny us if he's given us the incomparable, the supreme jewel of Christ himself slain for us, for our sin? No, he will not withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly, those who faithfully trust in his promises and then walk in the way of his commandments. Okay, quickly, I'm almost out of time. I'm out of time. But we've seen the source, certainty, scope, supply of God's provision. Let's look finally at the sphere of God's provision. Where are all the benefits of this blessing bound up? Read verse 19 with me one last time. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And here we're in a familiar place for Paul. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, verse 7 in chapter 4, guards the hearts and minds of those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul says he can endure every circumstance with genuine contentment, verse 13, in Christ Jesus. And now he says that the rich supply of God's gracious provision to fill to the full our every need is found in Christ Jesus. It's only through living and vital union with Christ that we can have any hope to enjoy these magnificent blessings that God promises. Because God has exalted His Son to the preeminent place above all things. And so there's no gift of God that can be enjoyed by us, His creatures, except that it be enjoyed in the person of His Son. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2.3. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily, Colossians 2.9. Our God and Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1.3. And friend, if you sit here this morning outside of Christ, if you, hear, you are here an unregenerate person, and you hear about the grace of God that was at work in the hearts of the Philippians, the grace of God that freed them from their suicidal preoccupation with themselves and with their things such that they could joyfully and eagerly beg for the favor of participating in the needs of the saints to give beyond their ability. If you hear all that and you recognize that you've not experienced that grace that brings that kind of freedom, that you recognize that you are still bound in slavery to serving yourself, but you desire for that large-heartedness and that selflessness that permeated the Philippians' lives. Well, I just, I just beg you, don't leave this room today believing that you're going to just go set on a moral improvement plan. Okay, got to give more. Okay, got to be more generous. Don't go away thinking that the call of Christianity is simply to modify a few external behaviors so that you can become a better you. No, the call of Christianity is that you must be born again. The grace of God that produces this kind of giving which results in the rich provision of God's blessing is only available to you in Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is yours if you will have him by faith this morning. If you would turn from your sin and trust in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on your behalf for your righteousness, you can leave this room this morning in Christ Jesus. And you can feast on every spiritual blessing that is yours in Him. Friend, would you turn, forsake your sin finally, and come to Christ this morning in whom are, is every spiritual blessing? And then these great truths about God's abundant mercy and rich provision to meet all our needs in Christ leads Paul to where it must lead us, to exuberant praise and worship. Verse 20, now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The only appropriate response to such magnificent truth as this is to overflow in doxology, to overflow in praising God for His worth, his honor, his power, his splendor, his wisdom, his majesty, and his grace. The only proper response to theology is doxology. 
when the mind truly perceives divine truth, when the mind truly understands biblical doctrine, the heart must of necessity ardently yearn that glory be ascribed to God's name forever and ever. For even an eternity will not be sufficient to exhaust the worth of God's name. And so Paul says, be, him, be unto him glory forever and ever. And my prayer is that that response would be the response of every one of you, that the truth of God's word might have so penetrated your minds this morning that your heartfelt cry from the depths of your souls is now to God, to our God and Father, be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Father, we just we pray that you would be glorified. We pray that you would make yourself big and, and, and glorious and show yourself off in the way that we use the resources that you've given us. May we be a free, cheerful, giving people. May we, we give without coercion, without, be, without being begrudged in it. But may we give because we've, we've beheld the value of your own worth in Christ. And may you, again, bring glory to yourself. Now to you be glory forever and ever. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. For more information about the ministry of the Grace Life Pulpit, visit at www.thegracelifepulpit.com. Copyright by the Grace Life Pulpit. All rights reserved.